So a couple of weeks back, we started a, looking at a passage of Scripture, and the challenge was, do not love the world. And we talked about what that meant exactly of what it means to do not love the world. But ultimately, we boiled it down to this. The world and its desires pass away. In other words, every temptation, every struggle, everything that you think about or want to accomplish or obtain in this world is going to pass away. And if you let these things control you, if you let it control your mind or your heart, you're going to miss out on the eternity that Christ has for you because you lived for something temporary and short now. So when we find ourselves in these temptations and we find ourselves in struggles, we need to keep our focus of what we're dealing with here on this earth is just temporary and focus on what God has for us throughout eternity. And it was written down, there were three different areas that we were told that all categories fit into. The cravings of a sinful man, the lust of the eyes, and the boasting of what someone does or what they have. So today, I'm going to talk to you about that boasting part. We've covered the other two. And I'm going to tell you, God's been dealing with me of the dangers of pride. Last Saturday night, when I spoke my portion that was there for about 15 minutes to speak, was ab about pride. And God has used surgeries and illnesses and all other kinds of things this year to do a lot of breaking of pride. And even Saturday morning, before I got up and spoke Saturday night, something happened that just sort of rubbed me the wrong way. And I realized I was getting aggravated over it when I got to thinking about it. First off, I didn't want to get up uh, later on that night and expect God to use me if I had a bad attitude. And so I started praying, God, help me see what is really going on here. And I realized ultimately what happened was my pride had been injured. And I didn't like it too much. And so I sat there and started repenting to God because I thought God had stripped me of so much pride. I felt like literally there was no pride left in me. And yet God was showing me just a few hours before I was going to be speaking to people about pride, how there was still some pride in me. He wanted to take it away from me. And sometimes pride can be in different forms. It can be in the forms of wanting people to think that you've done a good job in what you've done. You want to be noticed or you want to be seen or heard. And I know there's nothing wrong with being in a good, it's sort of tough using the word pride because you want to say, you know, you have pride in your family or you have pride in doing good work. But at the same time, we're talking about a sinful pride that controls you, that makes you want to be seen and heard. And I believe everybody struggles with this. So if you feel like I'm saying something, you're like, oh man, he's talking to me. I'm talking to everybody, including myself in this. You can be doing your work and doing it the best. And if you see that somebody else gets the pat on the back, you get very frustrated because you're like, did nobody see what I'm doing here? That's the biggest frustration. I think it hurt to our pride that we get so much. Wanting to be seen, wanting to be heard, wanting people to recognize we've actually done something and done something well. And other times it's taken in the forms of wanting what I see others getting to do. I'm just calling out my own sin and struggle with it. I see somebody get a great opportunity. A few years ago, I, I was at a youth conference in North Carolina. I took my youth group that I was youth pastor of at the time. And a friend of mine, from that, uh, a friend of mine actually now pa is youth pastor in Tennessee, was getting to speak. And I was so happy for him. When I saw he was on the schedule, I knew my kids would love it. We had had him for a youth revival. And I was so excited for Adam to have that opportunity. And then when he got up and started to preach, in my mind, I started going over. I remember... Adam, before Adam really responded to his call. I'd been called to preach before that. It was so stupid and foolish. I was happy for my friend Adam, and he may even get to watch this video one day and sit there and go, I never knew he felt that way. It was something foolish that apparently was deep down inside of, I'm going, why did he get the opportunity? They never asked me to do these kind of things. It's a prideful issue that can come up in us. And it's pretty easy to fall into the trap of pride. 
I think every single one of us struggle with it. From the youngest ones, uh, the, if you take the youngest kid that's back there, their pride can be injured and they can fight out of pride. Uh, for kids, a lot of times it's the pride of struggling with their parents and they're going to do their own thing and they're going to make sure they do things the way they want to. It's pridefulness. For those of you in marriages, if you've ever had that moment where you didn't want to admit that you were wrong and it was so much easier to point out when you thought the other person was wrong, that's pride that's going on in your life. That's a struggle that you're going through. But God speaks clearly to us about the sin of pride. I want you to hear me clearly on this. God hates pride. We don't like talking about God and hate. Usually when we do that, we talk about people that have lost their minds and their churches are way off base on what they're saying when we're talking about God and hate. But God hates pride. It's because when we're prideful, we're putting ourselves in God's place. We're saying that we know better for ourselves or we're not receiving enough glory ourselves. And in all honesty, from the moment you become a follower of Christ, everything you should be doing and everything you should be saying, whether it's at the workplace, whether it's with friends, whether it's inside your household with your spouse or your family, everything we do should point to Jesus. If it doesn't point to Jesus or lead somebody to Jesus or show Jesus' love to somebody else, then you are acting out of pride. You're doing something for yourself. I, I've struggled with, um, when we finished last Saturday night service, several people came to us and they were like, I really like what you did. And I thought then they missed the point if they liked what I did. If they liked what the choir did or what Kimmy did leading worship, they missed the point because the point that night was Jesus. And if any speaking or leading of worship or anything like that pointed to us as individuals, then we failed. We were supposed to be pointing to Christ. For you, how you interact with everybody that you interact with, you need to be showing them the love of Christ. And if you're not, you're pointing to yourself and that's pride. You're trying to receive the glory that should be received out of God or received of, of God. So that's why God hates it. Not because he's some egomaniac trying to receive all the glory, but whenever you're acting in business for yourself and you're acting selfishly, you're going to end up hurting other people. And that's why he wants you to be focused on bringing glory and loving the way he does. In Leviticus chapter 26, verse 19, it says, I will break down, this is God speaking to the children of Israel, the people that were following God. I will break down your stubborn pride and make the sky above you like iron and the ground beneath you like bronze. It's gonna be, if you are acting pridefully, God's eventually gonna step back and say, you think you know the best way to do things? You're not willing to listen to me? I'm gonna let you do it. But when you do this, it's gonna get hard to breathe. That sky is gonna be like iron to you. It's almost gonna be like, a, you know how it is when you step outside and it's super muggy and you feel like you've almost walked into jello because it's so just, you feel surrounded by nothing but moisture, dampness, and you can't breathe. And he says he's going to turn the sky to almost iron. Another way of saying it was that there wouldn't be rain. So whenever their crops, they were trying to uh, raise up their crops, there wouldn't be the rain that would come down. He would close it off. So what you're trying to do to be successful is going to be in vain. He also says that the ground beneath would be like bronze. In other words, he would harden up the ground so those seeds that had been planted, the ground that had been tilled up, would all of a sudden be solid and firm and nothing can break through. For some of you, you feel like your life, everything you're doing is in vain. God may have shut up the heavens to kill off your stubborn pride. Maybe your labor that you see that you've done, it, you feel like you've worked so hard and there's nothing to show for what you've done. Maybe God's let the ground become like bronze because of your pride. He's trying to break you of your stubborn pride and get you to the point that you make him the only thing. I started to make a mistake and say that he wants to be first, but back almost a year ago, I preached to you, God doesn't want to be first in your life. He wants to be the only thing in your life. And so he goes on to say that whenever we have pride, not only does God not receive the glory, we end up hurting those around us. I don't know about you, and I'm not trying to stir up 
bad emotions in you, but if you think of somebody you know that's prideful, I doubt the first thing you think of is the most generous person, the most loving person, the one that makes you feel the moment you walk into a room that they are the greatest, that you are the greatest person. Instead, they make you know that they are the greatest person that's in the room. That's why our pride hurts others in that. And for that reason, that's why God hates pride. And there's a scripture that we misquote a lot of times. It's Proverbs 16 and 18. It says this, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. If God does not kill the pride in you because you allowed that pride to be killed, you're going to fall. You're going to stumble. We've seen it out of preachers. God's blessing and they see all of a sudden incredible things going on, and then they get prideful and they forget, hey, it was never God doing that. They start thinking, look at what I've done. Look at what I've built. Look at whatever is going on around me. Look at whatever happens whenever I'm in the midst of people that are in need, and it becomes about them. And God eventually, after a while, just says, fine, I'll step back and let's see how well you do. And there is a fall and a disgrace that happens in their lives whenever that takes place. It's not just individual pride. It can be a group of people's pride. I even mentioned last Saturday the scripture passage that many people are quoting anytime that anything bad happens in our nation as they go to Second Chronicles and they start bringing up, if my people will pray, well, if they will humble themselves and seek my face and pray, I will heal their land. And what I want, I, the one thing that I always want to focus on that so many people seem to miss is God saying, if my people will stop being prideful, if the followers of God will stop being prideful and will get on their knees before God and cry out to God, what God's saying is, is it's not just an individual thing. It can be a nation's problem, their pride. I've heard many people over the last several weeks talk about things going on in our nation and many of them are starting to say, I see our nation going so far away from God. Why? Because our nation who rose up in such a short amount of time, no nation has accomplished as much in a short amount of time as what our nation has. But we've gotten to the place our nation looks and says, look at what we can do on our own. We don't need God. And then now we're starting to see the judgments of God and things happening in our land. It's when God's people, we want to look and point at the sinners and say, if they would just get right with God and if we could just legislate holiness and if we could get Congress to change some rules or whatever. No, God says, if my people will humble themselves, they will seek my face, they will cry out, then I will heal their land. So once again, the people of God, their pride. I've seen it in churches. I've seen it even not with mega churches. I've seen it in smaller churches that God starts doing something incredible. God starts doing something that's a mighty move in the midst of people and people are getting saved and the people at church start saying, I don't know why you go to that church down the street. It's dead. It's not good. It's not this. It's not that. Come and see what happened at our church. It's why I don't like church hopping. There's too many lost people. I don't need people to jump from one church to another church. I need to go reach the lost. That's what we're called to do. And I'm not talking about when God leads somebody to come and help out like Tammy and Tommy did and Lindsay and Andy did. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when people just jump from church to church, wherever the big thing's happening at that moment. And I see that pride rise up and I have seen God bless with incredible revival and church start growing and churches start doing well. And then all of a sudden they start looking around. Pastor gets a little prideful. The church does. Look at what we've done. Look at what we've accomplished. God will not share his glory with anybody else. And if we start being prideful, and I'm going to tell you why this is so heavy on my heart, the church side of this. I believe with all my heart, I will come back to visit one day. And Kimmy will tell you, I've shared this with her over a year ago. I believe with all my heart, I will come back to visit this church one day and preach, and this church will be standing room only. I believe it with all my heart. I have no doubt that that's going to happen. I believe that, that if this church will dig in and reach the lost around here, God's going to do some incredible things here. But what would be sad to me is to turn right around and find it in the worst shape it's ever been, maybe to the point of even closing doors because pride got involved and people thought it was because of them. 
I'll never forget what my grandpa said, Raymond Lawson, the pastor of this church back in the early 80s, late 70s. I can't remember exact time frame, but around then. My grandpa Lawson told me, he said, whenever you go to pr pastor, everybody else is going to be seeking the big churches and try hoping they get the big churches. Go to the church that whenever you see a move of God happening, you know it was always God and it was never you. I've tried to do that with everything in my life is sometimes put myself in an impossible situation so God shows up and God does something. I believe this church with all my heart is just at the point of we've, we've broken up some ground that needed to and we've planted the seeds and there's a good reputation. When we, two years ago, we would talk to some people and, oh, do you go to that church? We had some tell us they thought the church was not even open anymore. There was cracks in the door. Tommy's run into a lot of these situations. But God has blessed and you've been faithful and we've listened to the heart of God. And all I've seen is we've been breaking up the ground to get the integrity at this church. We've been breaking up the ground to get this church ready physically for the people to be here. And we've planted the seed now. Now it's time to go and plant some more seed and water it. And it's ready for an incredible, what they would say, harvest, growing. But if pride gets involved, God's not going to let it stay. We want to build something lasting here. We want something that's going to stay because God is determined he will kill the pride in us. Why? Not because God is some hateful God standing up there with lightning bolts just waiting to zap you. It's because he wants the very best for you in life. And you know what? He loves your family. And he knows when you're at your worst, your family suffers. And he wants your family to be blessed. And so he wants the very best out of you so you can spread that hope. I want you to know God loves you so much. If you don't ever remember anything else I ever said, remember this slightly balding, slightly chubby guy standing up front that sometimes can stand on both of his feet telling you this, God loves you so much. He wants the very best for you, but that means there's a little bit of junk he's got to get out of your life so you can be that very best. He wants to kill your pride so you won't hurt those that, are trying, that you're trying to reach because many of you have shared with me, I want to reach my family, I want to reach my coworkers, I want to reach my neighbors. Well, you can't do that if pride's in your life. And so you won't hurt those that you love and you care about and so you won't hurt yourself and ultimately so you won't hurt your relationship with God. He wants to kill your pride. So I'm going to ask you today, let him cut your pride out of your life. That side of you that can never be wrong or never admit you're wrong, let him cut that out. That side of you that says, maybe some people look at me and says, I'm not exactly on the top of the totem pole, but at least I'm not so-and-so. <laughs> That's pride. Let him cut it out. We're going to close in just a moment with communion. And what I want us to do is take a moment and self-reflect. We always do this before we do communion. And I wanted to finish. Last thing we do here is I'm going to do communion and then I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing over you. And then I'm going to let you go. But we do this reflection time because the scripture is very blunt and honest that you should not take communion as it, the way the scripture puts it says unworthily. That means that you know that you're coming up to partake in the bread, which represents, or in this case, the crackers, which represent the body that was sacrificed from you. When Jesus gave his body that was broken and beaten for you. And we take this grape juice, which symbolizes the blood of Jesus that was shed to cover all your sins. And the scriptures tells us, don't take communion if your relationship with God is not right. What would be sad for me today is for any of you to feel like you couldn't take communion. I want you to reflect. And if you have known of any sin in your life, I want you to make it right with God today. Some of you tell me all the time, we're going to miss you. You want to show me love? Finally, break down the pride in your life and give your life to Christ. It's the greatest gift you could give me today. It's the greatest way you could show love to God and to me both. 
It's that she said, finally, I've been listening and I've been coming, but I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to break down my pride. I didn't want to finally look weak to everybody else. I was scared to admit there was junk in my life. Everybody's got junk in your lives. We are a bunch of messed up people that are in desperate need of a Savior, and you're not exempt from that. Give your life to Christ today. Get that hope and that peace that can only come from Him. I'm going to tell you from the few that have done that during my two years here, they get up with smiles on their face and they call me and they tell me, we feel free. We feel so much lighter. We still got junk to work through, but I feel so much lighter. And if you need to give your life to Christ today, if you know you could not take communion today because of junk going on in your life, I want you to come up and I want you to come and pray with us in the altar right now. Don't waste any time at all. Come and pray. I want you to come and pray. Make sure everything's right. Double check your heart. Now, if you know everything's fine with you, I want you with all of your heart to come up and in a moment we're going to take communion. But right now, I want you to make sure that's right. Maybe it's in the simple form of a prayer. God, I don't know of any sin, but Lord, I know pride is there. It's something we all struggle with. Remove any pride. Will you come and pray? this time I'm going to ask you if you will to come forward and Tommy's going to make and give you what we call the sacraments it's going to be a cracker and it's going to be grape juice but they we're going to talk about what they symbolize and we're going to take communion so if you will if you want to take communion today I want you to come on up and you could just stay up here if you want to or you can go back to your seats whatever you would choose but come and get those Norma do you need me to bring it to you I get it for you guys I'll let them break that. I'll get Joe. Oh, Joe's coming around. Norma, here you go. Norma, here you go. Here, I'll, yeah, I'll break some of that off for you. There you go. Yeah. Is that okay there? given thanks Jesus took the bread and he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me God, we just thank you. Your brokenness of your body was for our healing. Your brokenness of your body was to set us free. And the shedding of your blood was to set us free from our sin. Thank you, God. None of us are worthy. But we thank you and we accept it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can place this back up here and then uh, cups in there. And then I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing when everybody's able to get back to their seats. When are you going to be back? We'll come to visit from time to time, but I'm going to be traveling around. What happened to you today? Did I touch your life? 
Some did you give your wife the class today? Awesome, man. Did you? This is not going to be a sermon. Trust me, in about two minutes, I'm going to dismiss you. But God was speaking to Moses of what to do with the children of Israel. And some of you have heard this and never knew what this was, but this was a prayer of blessing that God gave for Moses to speak over the people. It's found in Numbers chapter 6, starting with verse 24. And he was to pray this, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And then it says, when you pray that prayer of blessing, I'm going to insert old Hickory Fellowship instead of Israelites. God told Moses, so they will put my name on old Hickory Fellowship and I will bless them. And that is my prayer. And that is Kimmy's prayer. Is that God is going to bless you individually. And out of your blessings and the overflowing of that blessing, you're going to bless others. And God will bless this church and this community. Pastor Tom. And I mean that seriously this time, not just associate pastor. (laughs) 